Good evening, dear friends. We continue in Leviticus, the topic of the sacrifices. And tonight we have chapter 23. And with the Lord's help, I'd like to divide it in three or four portions. And so tonight we will just read from verse 1 through verse 8. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the set feasts of Jehovah, which he shall proclaim as holy convocations, these are my set feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. No manner of work shall ye do. It is the Sabbath to Jehovah in all your dwellings. These are the set feasts of Jehovah, holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the first months, on the fourteenth of the months, between the two evenings, is the Passover to Jehovah. Verse 6, and on the fifteenth day of this month is the feast of unleavened bread to Jehovah. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. On the first day ye shall have a holy convocation, no manner of servile work shall ye do. And ye shall pre present to Jehovah an offering by fire seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. No manner of servile work shall ye do. So far the reading of the scriptures. Now this book we have seen speaks about the sanctuary, speaks about the service for God. Um, Leviticus has to do with the Levites, the tribe of Levi, and from the tribe of Levi were the priests. And here we see many things that they uh, were involved in. We see, for example, in verse uh, 9, 10, or 11, that uh, on the third feast, something was presented, the sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest, unto the priest. The priest had a key role to play in all these things, from chapter 1 to the end of this book. Now, there are many things that I'd like to draw your attention to, and so we'll go slowly tonight. First of all, this point. Jehovah spoke. The Lord spoke. He is the great communicator. God spoke the things into being. He spoke and it was there. He's the great creator God. And so what he says has tremendous power. He speaks with authority. He speaks to convey his thoughts. He spoke to Moses 35 times in this book. Five times, seven times. And then Moses is the mediator because Moses conveys then the message to the people. Moses speaks on God's behalf to the people. Now today, the Lord Jesus is our mediator. God, the eternal God, the triune God, He has revealed Himself in the person of the Son, the Lord Jesus, who became man, the Word became flesh. And so today God speaks through the Lord Jesus. Uh, also, God has now given us the Holy Spirit. The people of Israel, they did not have the Spirit dwelling in them. But the believers today, they have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And so we are very privileged. And so God wants to convey His thoughts to us in a direct way. Not through a man like Moses, but direct through the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, through His written word. Now, when you study this chapter 23, you see a master plan. This is um, really amazing how God has everything in control. When you see the greatness of His creation, everything was perfect. You can read that in Genesis 1. There is a wonderful plan as you read Genesis 1. That is in connection with creation. But when you, it comes to redemption, God also has a plan. And that plan is so detailed, so wonderful, that God takes His time to unfold His thoughts gradually, step by step. And what we see also in this, this plan 
it has a meaning for Israel, God's earthly people, and ultimately there is also a prophetic outline in these plans that will be fulfilled uh, in the millennium. And so we see seven steps that God takes to lead his people to the rest of the millennium. I'll come back to that in connection with the Sabbath. And so God is the great planner, he's the great organizer, he's the great communicator of his thoughts, and we have the privilege to have the written word in our hands. The written word that is so precise, so wonderful. As I mentioned, just one detail, the expression, the Lord spoke to Moses 35 times in his book. It's amazing. Here in this chapter alone, we have five times that the Lord spoke to Moses. Here in verse 1, then in verse 9, then in verse... Uh, 23, the third time, then in verse 26, the fourth time, and then in verse 33, the fifth time. So that shows that God has important messages to convey to us through Moses. We will see uh, some details about the historical setting. Uh, but before we do that, I want to say a few things about this expression, the set feast of the Lord. Literally, the, s the appointed times, the appointed seasons. And what is very striking to me, this expression is found for the first time in Genesis 1, in connection with creation, when God... Um, put the sun and the moon in their place, it was for seasons. Seasons is that same word, set or appointed times. So there in creation you see how God is in control. And so here in connection with redemption, God has a master plan, set or appointed times. The word feast is a different word in, uh, in Hebrew, hag, that's used three times in this chapter or maybe less even, but it is used in connection with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days, the Feast of Weeks, seven days, the Feast of Tabernacles, seven days. In Exodus, the word feast is used in connection with those three special weeks of feast. But the word that's translated feast in some translations here in verse 2, literally means appointed times. But that same word, a point is also used in connection with the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting really means the tent of appointment. And if you count all those occasions of this word set or a point, you find 49 times. Seven times, seven times in this book, this word. It's amazing. That shows how precise the scriptures are. And so when the people of God come together on these set times, it is in Leviticus also in connection with the tent of meeting, the tent of appointment. There God had an appointed with his people to meet his people. It's amazing. And so what God plans in these set times is also connected with the gathering of his people around himself, the tent of meeting. And tonight in our prayer we thought of the privilege we have to gather to the name of the Lord. That's the same concept. We're gathered to the name of the Lord. That is the, our appointment, to be in his presence, at an appointed time, an appointed place. Then we see in verse 2 that Israel should proclaim these set times. There we see Israel as God's people, as a testimony in this world. Now today Israel is not my people. Israel is in rebellion as a nation. They will soon accept the Antichrist. But God has a plan. One day they will be his earthly people and God will use them to bless the whole earth, as we will see that in connection with the seventh feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. But here we see the people had to proclaim these things. Now today, we are God's people. I'm not saying that we took Israel's place, but the thought of a testimony. In that sense, we are now the believers taken from Jews and Gentiles, 
and I hope all of you here are true believers, children of God. All the believers belong to God's people, to God's testimony. And we have this privilege to proclaim these convocations. These are holy convocations. The word convocation means um, a special gathering together. In the New Testament, we have that idea in connection with the assembly, in connection with the church, gathered together. In uh, the word episynagogue, that is a gathering together. Soon the Lord Jesus will come, and then there will be a gathering, and we will meet the Lord in the air. But while we wait for Him to come, we have the gathering around Himself. That's a holy convocation for us. But here in this chapter we find seven special occasions for the people of God to come together. And so these holy convocations needed to be proclaimed. That's a testimony for God. Because these things are for God's pleasure. Yes, the people was involved, but it is for His delight. Holy means set apart for Him. The first time we find this word is in Genesis 2. The seventh day. God hallowed the seventh day. He sanctified the seventh day. He set it apart for Himself. And the word holy is connected with the word sanctuary. It's connected with many concepts in Scripture. But the basic idea is it's set apart for God. And so these gatherings were set apart for God. When we come together as a family in our homes, you could call it a convocation. But that's not a holy convocation. It's a gathering in our homes. We have special occasions. And we can even come together in a social context. A social gathering. That's nice. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But the holy convocation is something special that is for God's pleasure as He has ordained it, as He has planned it. And so these feasts are called feasts of the Lord, in verse 2. Often they are also called feasts or set times to the Lord. It is all for Him and of Him. And so that is the key idea. In the New Testament, in John's Gospel, we see that the Jews had made these feasts to feasts of the Jews. John ex uses that expression many times. The feast of the Jews. Passover or the feast of tabernacles. A feast of the Jews. Why did he do that? Because they used those feasts which were for the Lord. They used them for their own interest. For their own status. For their own satisfaction. For their own privilege. That is not how God had given them. And so John... Uh, mentions that to show why they rejected the Lord Jesus because they were self-centered and only focused on their own status and interests. That can happen to us also. But the Lord wants us to focus on Him that these holy convocations are not for our pleasure, for our delight, but that we seek to honor God, that we seek to do something for His pleasure. Always seeking to do what is pleasing to the Lord. That's a challenge for all of us. But also as an assembly, a holy convocation to seek to do what is pleasing to Him. So these feasts were for the Lord. And so today also when we come together, it is for Him, for His pleasure, for His delight. And then we will be blessed at the same time ourselves as well, of course. But if we put our blessing first, then it becomes like a feast of the Jews. It becomes something of us and for us. That's not the intention. Now why does it start with the Sabbath in verse 3? It has often confused me when I thought of those seven feasts. I thought, but if you count the Sabbath also, you have eight. How can that be? We have to understand that the seven feasts were connected with the whole year. Starting with the first month, as we will see in verse 4, till the seventh month, and there were seven feasts. But the Sabbath had a very special place. 
The Sabbath had a special place in connection with creation. God rested. God hallowed that day. That's in connection with creation. But here in this book we are in connection with redemption. And we see in Exodus how God gave a special place to the Sabbath. You can read in Exodus 31. The Sabbath day became the token of God's covenant between himself and his earthly people. The Sabbath was a very important day. And the Sabbath was a day of rest. Literally it means to cease from working. And so the expression here, Sabbath of rest, is really a superlative. Sabbath, Sabbaton, that means really a special Sabbath. A day of rest. Day that you cease working. That happened with God in creation. Genesis 1, six days of work, seventh day he rested. And he held that day. He blessed the day. Now here... In connection with God's plan, God's master plan of redemption, we see that everything starts with the Sabbath. Why is that? Because God has done the work. Not only the work of creation, God has also done the work of redemption. What did the Lord Jesus say on the cross? After, at the end of the three hours of darkness, what did He say? It is finished. It's paid in full. The work was done. Complete. That is the foundation. That is the basis on which we stand. That is the true Sabbath. And so that is why there is no manner of work. God cannot have anything to compete with that. God has done a work. The Lord Jesus has completed it. And there is no competition. There is no work that can be done. It's all done. And if you try to do a work, it really interferes with what God has already done. I'm not saying that we should not be marked by good works, but it is not good works in order to achieve our salvation. The salvation is on the basis of the accomplished work of Christ, and that sets the foundation so that we can work works that are pleasing to God, but that's a different concept. But the works are excluded. Works in order to obtain a status for God, in order to obtain salvation or whatever it is, all those works are excluded. Some try to improve themselves. This is work that will not succeed. God only can do that. And He did it in Christ. He has set aside the first, the old man, and He introduced a new man. And so if we try to improve the flesh or the old self, we are doing the wrong thing. God has dealt with that already. And so there is now rest. You can only have rest when you stand on that foundation. So in connection with creation, in connection with redemption. But we are in a world full of turmoil. What did the Lord Jesus say? Come unto me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's the only one who can give that rest. You cannot do it on the basis of your own efforts. He will give it, but you have to come to Him. And then He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you'll find rest for your souls. That is so important. That rest is something that we can only achieve by obeying, by following Him. So that is an application in connection with this Sabbath of rest. Only rest that we can have if we receive it from the Lord. But that's not the whole story. You see, at the end of verse 3 it says, It is the Sabbath to Jehovah in all your dwellings. So they had to practice that where they, were, where they were living. But it was in view of the future Sabbath. Now, now it is a bit difficult perhaps to understand, but I really want to make that clear. The Sabbath that the Lord started with, the rest that we find here, 
is also a picture of what he will introduce in the world to come. When the Lord Jesus will come back to reign over this earth, he will introduce the true rest of God. And that will not be achieved by human efforts, by the UN or whatever peace missions there are. This will only be achieved by the Lord himself. He will bring that rest on this earth. But while we are waiting for Him to come, and we also wait for Him to come, to take us away from this scene, the rapture, we look forward to His appearance when He will reign with us on this earth. But while we wait for Him, we can already enjoy this rest of our souls that we saw in Matthew 11. So this concept of rest is important. It is the foundation that God has laid, but it is also the ultimate purpose that he has to bring rest in this whole universe and that is what we see in the connection with the seven days of the tabernacles the seventh feast at the end of this whole series we find it there again and then the rest will be ushered in a time of blessing the millennium wonderful here's the basis and that's why the sabbath is so important and then that will be a long sabbath of thousand years Verse 4, these are the set feasts. So we talked about what God has appointed, what God has set. And now he is going to give a whole list to Moses. And we start here in verse 4, with the first one. Again, it said, set feasts of Jehovah, of the Lord. It belongs to him. But as I said, it's also for him. Because the end of verse 5, where is the first feast, the Passover, it is to Jehovah. It is for him. It's for his pleasure. Now, if we talk about the Passover, we see it was for the people of Israel, first of all. When they were in Egypt, they were in bondage. They were under the control of Pharaoh, a type of Satan in that context. They could not deliver themselves. And so, human beings today in this society, they cannot deliver themselves, they cannot set themselves free from bondage. It takes a divine intervention, and that's very real. Now, in Israel, what we see then in this uh, Passover feast, Passover means, Pesach means, pass by, pass over. What does it mean? They had to take a lamb on the tenth day of the first month. Now, I have to go slowly now because there are so many elements here. The first month was actually the seventh month. But in Exodus 12 you see that God says, But the seventh month, I make it the first month. Why was that? Because everything begins with the Lamb. This was the month of the Lamb. And that's also very practical for us. When does our life really begin? The moment that the Lord Jesus is introduced into our lives, the moment that we have seen the Lamb of God and accepted His work and accepted Him, that becomes the first month. And so it was for Israel on this earth, the seventh month became the first month, because that was the month that He introduced the Lamb. Now that was still in the days of those ten plagues, you remember, in Exodus. And before the ninth plague fell upon Egypt, the extreme darkness, the three days of darkness, Moses had already given instructions to Israel about the Lamb, what they had to do. And so when the darkness came, they had already the lamb in their house. It's amazing. And that was the tenth day of the month. Now I want you to think about that. First of all, what does the lamb mean for us today? When you go to Genesis 22, you see that Abram talked to his son Isaac. God had said to Abram, sacrifice your son on one of the mountains that I will tell you of. And then Isaac asked, about the lamb, he said, I have the fire, you have the fire, the, the knife, but where's the lamb? And then Abraham said, God himself will provide a lamb, my son. And in this chapter, Genesis 22, we see the lamb already. Isaac was the lamb, but it is a picture of the one who truly would be the lamb provided by God. 
and God provided a ram, a male lamb, in Genesis 22, who took Isaac's place. The ram died in Isaac's place. The ram was the substitute for Isaac. But there we have the idea of the lamb of God who's going to be the substitute. When you go to Isaiah 53, take a note and you read it. You see the lamb right there. And you see how he suffered. He didn't open his mouth. He was like a sheep led to the shears. He did not open his mouth. Then we see the sufferings of the divine lamb. It's a tremendous chapter. It is amazing how precise God gave all these instructions to Isaiah and he wrote them down. All these details about the lamb of God. You go to Zechariah, you see more details. You go to John 1, and you see, you hear John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. There He is. And there is His work. He would give Himself, and then ultimately, the sin of the world would be taken away. The Lord gave Himself on the cross, but the full results, the full effects of His work are not seen yet in this creation. They are seen in connection with the new creation. We belong to the new creation now. But in the eternal state, then this, all sin will be done, gone. That is on the basis of the Lamb of God who gave Himself. This is the identification. John said, this, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the full effect is still future, but the work is accomplished. And John said, this is the Lamb of God. The second day he said, behold the Lamb of God. And then the disciples followed Him. That is the attraction, the Lamb of God. He's everything. So His work is the basis to remove sin from this universe. His person is the center of attraction, to follow Him. The word Lamb is used two more times in the New Testament. In Acts 8, where we see a quote from Isaiah 53, when Philip explained Isaiah 53 to the this minister that came from Ethiopia, the eunuch, and he explained about Isaiah 53, the Lamb. The first time we have the Lamb in 1 Peter 1, foreknown from before the foundation of, world, of the world. But we are redeemed by His precious blood, not by silver and gold. And Peter applied that to the believing Jewish remnant in those days. And we may apply it to us today. We are now redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. In Revelation you find 28 times the word in a diminutive form, in the little lamb. The little lamb. And there we see in, in uh, Revelation how the little lamb will have all power and will even take on the dragon and he will introduce God's world, God's reign, God's peace on earth. The little lamb. But the expression lamb is used only four times in the New Testament. The verses that I explained. And then the point of the tenth day. You know what happened the tenth day? Of this month, the Lord had His triumphant entry into Jerusalem. That was the tenth day of this first month. And then we see how He was examined. We see in Exodus 12 that the Lamb was going to be um, tested. It had to be checked out if it was without blemish. And it was fulfilled in connection with the Lord Jesus, the true Passover Lamb. He was checked out. They couldn't find anything. The mouse was stopped. And then, when the time has come, he gave himself as the Lamb of God. It's amazing. And that was on the 15th day, as we find here, excuse me, on the 14th day. So, the Holy Convocation in verse 4 is a special occasion of the people of God to come together. This occasion is proclaimed in its season, in the set time. And that's very precise, as I mentioned in connection with the tenth day. God is very precise. So this is the first month, we talked about that. It's the beginning of the period of 12 months. It is the 14th day. Why is that so important? 
So the tenth day, they had the lamb introduced into the house. Egypt, the darkness came. But in Israel, in Goshen, where Israel dwelt, there was light. Of course, first of all, literally there was no, the plague of darkness was not on them. But morally, spiritually speaking, the Lamb was in their houses. That's, what, that's why there was light in their dwellings. Again, the word dwelling. And they observed the Lamb, it was without spot. And then on the 14th day, and God is very precise. It was between the two evenings. What does that mean? Some translations have uh, a twilight or something like that. But it's very precise. The first evening started just after noon. When the sun goes down, that's where the first evening starts. The second evening was at sundown. Between the two is in the middle of the afternoon, that's three o'clock. What happened at three o'clock? The lamb died. He cried out, as I said, it's finished. And then he rested his head. The Lord died at that moment. That was at this exact moment. In between the two evenings. But now... For Israel, it was important to have the blood on the lintels and on the doorpost. That was for protection against judgment. The Israelites were not better than the Egyptians. We were not better than the people in this world who are still under God's judgment. But God has put our judgment on the Lamb, on the substitute. And what we see then, the Lamb became food for the Israelites. Food, what does that mean? They needed to have strength to leave Egypt. And we need strength, we need to have the right kind of food to be spiritually strong and to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to eat from the Passover lamb. And so that would also be a topic for further study. What happened? The next day, and that is very closely connected on verse 6, the 15th day of this month. Um, before we get there, I just wanted to uh, mention, you can study the seven Passovers in the Old Testament. Every Passover is very interesting to study. In Exodus, it's a different setting. Then in Numbers, in Numbers, they were in the wilderness, Numbers 9, and then they had to learn to see the lamb as a memorial, as a feast that they could have in the wilderness. When they came into the promised land in Joshua 5, they had the lamb again, but in a different setting. Now they were in the promised land. And so the times that the Passover is mentioned in the scripture, that's always in a different setting. Later, Israel failed, and then we see in days of revival, the Passover is mentioned again in the days of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, in the days after the Babylonian captivity, and also in Ezekiel 45, when he looks forward to the millennium to come, even in the millennium, they will have the Passover lamb. They will look back to the first Passover. So it's a very rich um, topic to study for us. The Passover is the basis for everything. The basis for all the other feasts that are following. And for us also, the work of the Lord Jesus, the Passover lamb, is uh, basic, is foundational. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, the Passover lamb, you're still in your sins. You're still lost. So this is a foundational matter. You need to know the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, who gave Himself for you, so that you can be saved and stand on that foundation that He has laid. And then you can study in the New Testament, and what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 5? Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. 
He is the Passover. So it's not my ideas. Don't take these things. Read in the scriptures and you see in 1 Corinthians 5 that Paul says, Christ is our Passover. And then he says that we should celebrate the feast with unleavened bread. So we come now to the unleavened bread. And that's an important point also. The two go together. You cannot have the Passover lamb and still continue in your sins or in, in corrupt lifestyle. The two that, that didn't go together. The Lamb of God was there to take the sins of him, on Himself. And so how can you celebrate that feast while you are living in sin? That's why Paul explained to First Corinthians, the, the believers in Corinth at that time, there was someone in their midst who lived in sinful condition. And this man needed to be disciplined. But it was in order that he would learn his lesson. He didn't listen. But ultimately he listened through this extreme form of discipline that was exercised. Why was that? So that they could celebrate the Passover lamb. So that they could celebrate in the right condition. And Paul says that, that you should celebrate it. And I'll read that for you. It is an important point. In 1 Corinthians 5. I'll just turn to it. In verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? I'll talk about that a little bit more, about the leaven. It has this penetrating effect. It makes the dough rise and it affects the whole dough, the whole lump. And that's a an ex, ex, uh, excuse me, a type, an illustration of evil. Evil has that characteristic that it makes things seem nice and makes them attractive, but it is evil. It goes as a process of corruption that goes on and on and affects everything. It can only be stopped by fire. The Lord Jesus went through the fire of God's judgment. The Lord was without leaven. But He took our sin upon Himself. And that is why He was in the three hours of darkness. Judged by God. A holy God. He went through the fire of God's judgment. And so, this leaven can only be stopped by the fire. And so we need to learn that if we have sins to confess, we need to confess them and really separate ourselves from these. And that's why Paul says, purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, according as ye are unleavened. Now what does that mean? Purge out the old leaven, we understand that. That's everything connected with the flesh. We are all sinners. And all these things that are connected with the flesh and with sin need to be purged. We need to judge them and set them aside. And realizing that this is what God has done in Christ's work. He condemned all these things already. But He wants us to apply the same judgment. And then he says, according as you are unleavened. So positionally, in Christ, we are unleavened. But now he says, I want you to be a new lump. I want you to be practically, by judging yourself, what you are positionally in Christ. So I repeat that. Paul says, my point is, I want you to be practically pure what you are in Christ. In Christ you are pure. But I want you to be practically pure. That's the standard that he presents to us. Now I repeat that we cannot achieve by trying to improve ourselves. It is by seeing ourselves in God's light, judging what is not correct, doing away what is not correct, and then we are in tune with what we are in Christ. And so also in the context of the assembly here in Corinth, they needed to apply that judgment. This man was not listening. He did not want to change his ways. And so he needed to be disciplined. But then in 2 Corinthians we see that he learned his lesson and he was restored. He was brought back. That was a deep exercise. So that is in connection with um, 
what we need to do personally to be in tune with what we are in Christ positionally. He wants us to be practically according to the holy standards that God applied to the Passover lamb and that is in connection with those unleavened bread. The leaven is not only the flesh that is in us before we were saved. The leaven we see also in those leaders that tested the Lord. The Lord was tested by the Pharisees. They have the leaven of hypocrisy, the leaven of legalism. He was tested by the Herodians, the leaven of worldliness. He was tested by the Sadducees, the leaven of worldly thinking, rationalism. He was tested in many ways. And we see that the Lord also explained in Matthew 13, the leaven was taken by a woman and then put into the three meals of pure um, the pure dough that was pure and the leaven was inserted in it and it became corrupted that's what happened in the history of the church it happened also in the history of Israel so that they were uh, really in idolatry Ezekiel 8 shows that and the glory of the Lord had to depart from them because of their idolatry idolatry is a subtle evil it is another form of leaven in the Church of Thyatira in Revelation 2, you see the woman Jezebel in connection with that leaven of uh, moral evil, wrong teaching. And so that brings me to another form, wrong teaching in Galatians 5 is called by Paul leaven. And that will leaven is the whole lump. So if there is wrong teaching, it has to be dealt with, otherwise it will affect all of us. So moral evil will affect us, so it needs to be judged. Wrong, doc, evil doctrine needs to be judged, otherwise it will affect us. So, all these forms of leaven need to be dealt with. The leaven, the leavened bread itself, means it was not leavened. And that's why it was flat. The matzah means unleavened bread. Matzot is the plural, unleavened bread, were small, like dishes, and uh, even transparent and you could, they were very light. But what we learn here now, this unleavened bread needs to be eaten. It was not attractive for the flesh, but it is attractive for the new, attractive for the new nature. The unleavened bread that I just explained what it is not, the unleavened bread is very pleasing to God. When you see the Lord Jesus in the Gospels, what did He say? I am altogether what I say. The Lord Jesus, there was no leaven whatsoever. He was real, was not puffed up. Leaven puffs things up. But in the Lord Jesus, there was none of that. He was real, He was transparent. That is the unleavened bread. And that is where the Lord wants us to feed on. Unleavened bread, it is to Jehovah. You notice here in verse 6, so the Passover was to Jehovah. The unleavened bread is to Jehovah. That was for His delight. When God looked on the Lord Jesus on this earth, He was completely pleased. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom, I'm found, in whom I have found my delight. He was for the Lord. And now we may feed the same bread together, that we may be pleasing to the Lord. This unleavened bread, we may appreciate. When we study the Lord's life in the Gospels, we learn to appreciate Him. It takes time. And then we want to appropriate, we want to make it our own, through faith. And then we become like Him. That is the result of eating. God wants us to take in this food, which is not attractive to the natural man, it's attractive, attractive to the spiritual man. The unleavened bread. And then He wants us to become practically unleavened. As we saw earlier, positionally in Christ we are already unleavened. But by eating this unleavened bread, 
practically we will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We, be, we will become more like Him, more Christ-like. That is the process of eating. God is very concerned about our eating habits. And you study the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. God speaks much about eating. He wants us to have the right kind of food. Now here it is. And what is so striking, we go to verse 7, on the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. So again, this is not only a personal, individual matter, it is a matter of the whole people of God. He wants us to be together, a holy convocation, to eat that unleavened bread together. But not only that. He repeats, no manner of servile work shall ye do. That is repeated many times in the scriptures, also in this chapter. Because it excludes every self-effort. We are living in a world that's marked by self-effort. I mentioned self-improvement is the idea of self-effort to achieve something through your own efforts. All that is excluded here in God's school. And this was for a whole week, seven days. The, le the unleavened bread, beloved, is for a whole week. What does it mean? For our whole life. It starts at the Passover lamb. The, the month, the first of the month. And till the Lord will come, He wants us to eat this unleavened bread. Seven days. A full period. And then in verse 8. Ye shall present to Jehovah an offering by fire, seven days. How can that be? When we occupy ourselves with the Lord, when we take in this food that we are talking about, it will make us ready to bring a sacrifice to the Lord. We are not occupied with self, with our own interests, we are occupied with what is pleasing to God, the unleavened bread. And that leads us then to bring the sacrifice by fire seven days. What does that mean? Every day these sacrifices were brought. There are more details in Numbers 28. We are studying the sacrifices. We started in Genesis 3. We went through Genesis. We went through Exodus. We went through Leviticus. Again, sacrifice. Why is it so important? Because the sacrifices speak of the Lord Jesus, of His sufferings, of His death, of how He honored God by presenting Himself to God. So this is a present that is brought to God. And it really means bring near to Him. God wants us to bring it very close to Him so that we enjoy fellowship with Him. So bring this to the Lord, an offering by fire, seven days. Those, the full period that we are here, God wants us to be worshippers. God seeks worshippers who worship Him in spirit and in truth. This whole period that we are here, full seven days. And then at the end, the conclusion, there is a holy convocation. And I suggested already earlier, it reminds me of this episynagogue, this holy convocation when the Lord Jesus will come and we will be raptured from this earth. That is our meeting with the Lord as Second Thessalonians 2 verse 1 explains. Then all the believers together will be, will be together to meet the Lord. That's the holy convocation that we will have at the end. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. I just make an application. Of course, in the literal context, there were other months that were following, and we hope to speak about those other months, those other occasions, the next time. But I make this application of this holy convocation when we will meet the Lord. No manner of servile work shall you do. It is repeated again. Nothing can be introduced by man's efforts. Now one more thing before I forget that. There was a Sabbath that followed the first day of the unleavened bread. Now just let's go over that very slowly, very well, quickly but in order. On Friday, that is when the Lord Jesus died, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He had eaten the Passover on Thursday night, but that was the same day. You remember in, in the 
In the Hebrew Bible, the day started at night. You can see that already in Genesis 1. Evening was, and then morning, day 1. Evening was, then morning, day 2, and so on. So the day starts at the evening. That evening of the 14th day, the Lord Jesus, He had the Passover lamb with the disciples in the upper room. And that same day, but then of course at the end, of the day, in the afternoon, towards the end of the day, on Friday afternoon, was still the same day, he died as the Passover lamb. In the temple, the moment that the Lord Jesus was crucified, nine o'clock in the morning, in the temple they presented the Passover lamb, that was then a special occasion for the priests, we know that from other scriptures and also from the Jewish writings, they had at 9 o'clock in the morning their Passover lamb. That is when the Lord Jesus was put on the cross. When the Lord Jesus died and said it is finished, after he had said it is finished, then all those types were fulfilled. All those shadows were fulfilled in him, the true lamb of God, the true Passover lamb, when he died. And so, this is rich. But then, the unleavened, the day of unleavened bread started the 15th day, so that was, in our language, Friday night. That was the beginning of the seven days of the, pas the unleavened bread. That was Friday night. Then, the Saturday, the Lord Jesus was in the tomb, that was the Sabbath. And in John 19, verse 31, it's called a great Sabbath. Why was that? Because it was, first of all, a Sabbath is great in Jewish thinking, but it was great because it was the Sabbath that you had the unleavened bread. It was also the Sabbath before the next day, on, in the morning, the third feast started that you have in verse 9 and 10, when he would bring a sheaf of the first fruit of the harvest at the end of verse 10. That was on Sunday morning. That was the beginning of the week when he would present that. That is the third feast. And so that is why this Sabbath was a great day, also in view of what would happen the next day. It would be the feast of the sheaf of first fruits. And so what is so amazing, this precision that you find in Scripture, how this came together, not only that the Lord was uh, presenting Himself as the Passover on the tenth of the month when He entered Jerusalem, then He died on that same day, the 14th day, then the 11th bread started, the 15th, and then on the 16th day of the month, then there was the day of His resurrection. That is the presenting of the first fruit. So we'll talk about that the next time, Lord willing. But you see how precise the scriptures are and how rich. And so we just, I've just scratched the surface vision. It's so deep, it's so wonderful. But it is encouraging for all of us. Even you hear this for the first time, you'll learn something. Even if you hear, hear something about this the hundredth time, we always learn something. And it is to magnify the Lord, as we had in our hymns, in our prayers at the beginning. It is really to present the Lord in His greatness as the great treasure. He's the treasure of God. He's the treasure of the Scriptures. He's our treasure. May we worship Him and bless Him. Amen.